If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one right in the seat in front of you, and I'm going to ask you to turn there to page 177, Colossians 3. Colossians 3, maybe you have your Bible on your app. Um, maybe you've actually brought a hard copy. Wow, that's rare anymore, right? There's something about being able to open up your own Bible, though, and scribble notes in it and all that stuff, but don't get me started. Okay, so Romans, or Romans, Colossians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 4, and then we're going to skip down to verse 9 and read uh, 9 through 14. Today we sang about tidings of comfort and joy, and Jeff's message was to be about joy, and, and I'm not sure of the passage that he was going to be preaching from today, but I believe that this passage here would speak to that comfort and would speak to that joy. And so we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail, but we want to read it first. Chapter 3 of Colossians 1 through 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now skip down to verse 9. It says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. If we looked at this passage, we would see that there is a cause and effect relationship that the that the Christian's position with God and his p performance for God. There is a position and a condition. It's, there's kind of a since this, then this. There is a past that's happened and therefore it affects the present. There is God's work and then our response. You work through this and it's because of what God has done for us that there ought to be a positive change taking place within us. Look at verse 1. It says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. That's the past event describing our position with God. And then it says, Set your hearts on things above. See, so that's since and then then, kind of like. Verse 9. Do not lie to each other. Since, basically, you have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. There he says, do not lie. That's the, that's the, the then part. That's the, okay, here's what's next. But really what comes first is we've put off the new self and we're being renewed in the knowledge and image of Christ. We are the creator. Verse 12, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, that's our position in relationship to God, then, then what? Well, what about that? Well, then clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's the performance in relationship to, our, to one another because of our position with God. Now, we live in a performance-based culture. It rewards accomplishment. It says, if you do this, you will receive this. And generally, it's the greater authority that's making the rules, and it's the greater authority that's putting out the conditions to say, you need to do this, and then I, as the greater authority, will reward you with this. Whether it's an employer, whether it's the government, and even religious. Religions get into this, right? Most religions, actually all religions, except for one, are based on this. Keep a set of rules. And then the God or gods will reward you. You see, the one key 
the one key or one of the keys to the Christian message is that it flips that completely upside down. Completely upside down. Instead of a man pursuing God, it's God pursuing man. Instead of man appeasing God, it's God coming down and pursuing man and doing all for man so that man might have that relationship with God. That's why Christianity is so unique. It's why Christianity is the answer. God pursues man first. God is taking the initial action. God is paying the greater price. It is Him doing for us. Emmanuel, what? God with us. He came here. We love Him because He, what? First loved us. We don't quite grasp that maybe all the time of how unique that message is. And in fact, I don't know about you, but I, I slip into that, that works mentality that I have to please God. I have to make sure I'm doing my, crossing my T's and dotting my I's. We slip into that even. We, we say we have accepted grace, he's forgiven us of our past, and then we work like crazy to earn his favor. <laughs> well, no. That's not how it works. The greater has rewarded the lesser here. And so let's, I want us to examine what he's done for us this morning in this passage. We could look at the, the, the second half of what is our response to be, but we're not going to take the time to do that, and you're probably glad about that, okay? But we're just going to look this morning at what this passage says of what he has actually done for us. What has he initiated? What, why, why do, can we have comfort? And why can we have joy? Because this morning we should be leaving this place with, in fact, that comfort and with that joy because of what God has done. Verse 1. Verse 1, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. You've been raised with Christ. What does that mean? Picture it this way. Your heart has stopped. It's not beating any longer. Tissue has started to die. And then they call in the paddles. And they charge them up. And they shock you. And the heart begins to pump again. The paddles have been used to revive the heart. Scripture says that we were dead in our transgressions. Our heart was a heart of stone. It was dead. But God has raised us to life. He has given us new life. Once our heart has been given new life, God implants His Spirit in us like a pacemaker that then empowers us to beat and tells us when to beat. We are not left alone to transform our lives into Christ-like persons. No, God is there assisting us, giving us the power to make the necessary changes. That's why the then part can come, because He has already made us able through this new life, being raised with Him, He has given us the spiritual power to live the life. You see, man is both body and spirit. And here it's dealing with the spirit. Our spirit it was dead in our sin. And when we became a Christian, our spirit experienced a new birth. Scripture uses several terms. New birth, made alive, born again. It was raised with Christ. All of those things have to do with the spiritual rebirth part of us. And as Christ was physically raised from the dead, Christians have been spiritually raised from the dead. Our spiritual heart has been given the power to beat again and connect with God. We have already experienced our first resurrection. The raising of our spirit. Verse 3 has another positive aspect of our position here. What God has done for us. For you died, and we could talk about that because that's part of it. But we're going to focus on this next part. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. 
Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. How is it hidden? What is he talking about there? One of the ideas here is that it's been put away for safekeeping. Your salvation is concealed, secure, and safe. Burglars cannot enter and steal it away. Hurricanes and natural disasters cannot destroy it. Satan and his demons cannot pluck your life from Christ's presence. Jesus has tucked your life away safely in his presence so that no outside force or source can remove you against your will from his safety deposit box. You're in safekeeping. Our spirit is in safekeeping. Where is Christ? Where is he at? He's in God. He's seated. Where is he seated? At the right hand of the Father, right? Now, I can't think of a more secure bank or vault than that. Can you? Can you imagine anything or anyone going up to the presence of God? There's God the Father and God the Son, and, and they're going to say, what are they going to say? There's no way. No way that they can approach that and steal us away. The presence of God keeps our position with God in safekeeping. That ought to give us hope. Because in this world, it could go. It could go. We feel, you know, our culture is so concerned about safety. Isn't it? You know, I think the more affluent a culture gets, the more concerned it gets about conserving its affluence and its safety. And we, so we have insurances for everything, you know. And... Uh, I just think of the Syrian Christians that have been uprooted from their homes or the, or the Coptic Christians in Egypt that are being persecuted. And their stuff, they, they have nothing. They've been, everything they have, they're running for their lives. And yet, they rejoice because they know that their life is secure in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. <laughs> but our life is also hidden from view of the world in a sense. Just as the world does not see Christ, it does not see our life with him. The world, in other words, really doesn't understand. We are curious people. We are to be strangers. We are to be different. We are to be weirdos. <laughs> and if if we're living that life, they, they know that. We, we're different. But they can't quite put a grasp on it because it's unseen. It's, it's like they can do anything to us and yet we can have comfort and we can have joy because our hope is not here. It's hidden from the view of the world. So we're raised with Christ, we're hidden with Christ, and then verse 4, it says this, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Robert pointed out this morning that we, the glory of God, and, his, and, and, and so forth, and, and we are going, there's going to be a day, it's hidden now, but there will be a day When Christ will be revealed. When he returns. There will be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? There will be a day when we will all see Christ in all his splendor and glory. There will be a day when, a, when our faith will be vindicated and proven true and be seen by all. There will be a day when we who call ourselves Christ's followers because of His grace will share in His glory for all the world to see. There will be a day when the bullies of this world will no longer rule. There will be a day when the corrupt governments and the regimes will no longer control. There will be a day when terrorists and extremists will no longer wreak their havoc. Friends, the glory of heaven, the glory of heaven awaits us. 
Heaven is a sure thing for us. And if you have been raised with Christ, if you have been hidden with Christ, then you can be assured that you will appear and reign with Christ in glory. Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me, when by His grace I shall look on His face. That will be glory. Be glory for me. Verse 10 brings us to our, another one. Another positive aspect of this salvation that we have. This position that we have with God. It says, And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. It says, we have put on the new self. Now, you've got to realize sometimes when it says we have done it, it's, it's indirectly we have done it because God has done it and because of that, we have done it. We didn't do it in our own effort. He has done it for us. But as we have received it, we have done it. And he says, we have put on the new self. Something God does directly with our spirit and we do indirectly by accepting Christ as our Savior. Scripture uses a metaphor of clothing, you see, this putting on. Uses this metaphor of clothing to describe this transformation. Listen to Isaiah 61. It says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Who's done the clothing? Who's done the robing? But God himself. Where does the salvation come from? Where has the righteousness come from? From the robe of righteousness come from? It's come from God himself. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 echoes this. He says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. What a beautiful picture. What a beautiful picture. We have clothed ourselves with Christ. How? Well, indirectly because he has given us this robe of righteousness. Picture our Picture with me, if you will, our sin-filled lives as a jacket that we have worn for a long time. And our thoughts and our motives and our words and our actions have left the jacket we are wearing hardly recognizable due to the tatters, due to the filth. And God, we're walking down the, 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 the street of uh, the marketplace and, and God's outside is this doorway and he calls out to us and he invites us to enter into his fine clothing store and, and there's something about it that we kind of don't want to you know but we just pulled that way and so okay we'll go and we enter in and we really kind of feel uncomfortable and yet there is this wonderful peace and this sense of acceptance and love and then he looks at us and, you know and he's looking at our jacket what we're wearing and almost simultaneously we are overcome with guilt this feeling of guilt and this feeling of shame and then he asks us kindly and respectfully and yet with the authority of being the owner would you like a new jacket? And our first thought is, I don't have any money to pay for it. But we really don't, we kind of re understand that maybe that's not the issue, and so we humbly nod. He takes our measurements, and he immediately goes to the only jacket on the only rack in the store. And he pulls the jacket off the rack and as he does, we notice the inside label says, Jesus, my one and only son. And like a master tailor, he gets behind us, gets the jacket on, flips it and it slips on to us. It fits perfect. It's the most beautiful jacket we've ever seen. 
never worn. And all we do is cooperate in receiving it. We realize something has happened. We're not the same person that we, we were. We have been changed, and the jacket has made all the difference. Friends, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, according to the Scriptures, you are not the same person you were before your conversion. God has made you new. He has given you a new heart, a new spirit. You have been born again. You've been regenerated. And when in faith we are baptized into Christ, the old coat is thrown away. And we're fitted with his robe of righteousness. And as God looks at us, he does not see our filth. He sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. Verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion. Well, see, there it says clothe yourselves, and we're not going to get into it, but there it says, okay, well, that's the then part, but we've already been clothed with righteousness. And see, so basically, the then part is match what you already are. Become what you already are. Our position with God is, is Jesus' righteousness. Now, live to become that. But we're not going there because we're focusing just on what he's done for us. And what has he done? He has chosen us. He has made us holy. We are dearly loved. Let's look at those. Chosen. Man, that's a nice, that's a nice concept. Don't you like to be chosen? You know, unless it's jury duty. <laughs> <laughs> and even that's a privilege if we really look at it correctly, okay? But anyway... Chosen. I, the idea of being wanted. God wants to have a relationship with you and me. I think of Zacchaeus. Now I kind of relate to Zacchaeus. You know, he's a wee little man. I, I like those guys. You know, Bill Dad the Shoe Height, all those kind of fellows in the Bible. I love those guys. Get it, Shoe Height? But, okay. <laughs> but Zacchaeus is up in the tree. I don't know if he was afraid for his life because he was a tax collector and, you know, or if he just couldn't see. We really don't know. Jesus turns to address him, says, look, I want to have dinner at your house today. That was an honor. That was a compliment. That was, Jesus was choosing to go to Zacchaeus' house. Wow. He chose Zacchaeus. He's chosen you. He's chosen me. And all we have to do is say, yeah, okay, I'm in. We are holy, it says. Therefore, God's chosen people, holy. What's it mean there? It doesn't mean that we are super righteous. The idea of holy, holiness and holy has two different meanings. And I believe right here it means this idea of set apart, separate. Set apart for God's special use. God has given us this, this calling on our life. He has given us a purpose for living beyond just this physical, tangible world. He has said, I want you in on what I'm all about. Restoring the rest of the world. Being the hands and feet and heart of Jesus. That's what I want you to be about. I'm going to give you a purpose that's beyond yourself. Purpose by definition is really outside of ourselves. He's given us a reason for living. And then he says, we are dearly loved. You know, over the years, Hollywood has portrayed uh, fathers as kind of bumbling, out-of-touch guys who always get it wrong, haven't they? You know, we kind of got a bad rap at Hollywood, I think. But I've noticed lately there's some hope. Advertisers are starting to boost us up a little bit as dads, okay? 
Here just recently, I've noticed a couple of advertisements that are painting a strong, loving picture of fatherhood. I said, great. Now, I know they're trying to market and sell us and twist us. And I. Let me give you an example. There's this one, else, uh, one commercial that's going on right now. Maybe you've seen it, maybe not. And there's this young dad, and uh, he's marching around the room, in his, and he's going, oh, 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 oh. he's sounding like some dinosaur, like, well, as if we knew what a dinosaur really sounds like, but, but he's, oh. and then uh, as he comes around the corner, the, the camera kind of pans down from his viewpoint and looks down and his two children are wrapped around his legs and they're having the time of their life. And a smile comes to our face and a lump comes in our throat. And they're dearly loved. And whatever dad looks like in our present state our present stage, age of life, or situation. Our Abba Father dearly loves us. Maybe it's a shoulder to cry on. He's there. Maybe it's a hand to hold us during health problems. He's there. Maybe it's dealing with confusion of life decisions, figuring out the Medicare plan f f maze of stuff, you know. Maybe it's family unrest or f the falling away of kids. Whatever it is, maybe it's just a joyful time of life. He is there sharing it with us because we are dearly loved. He has the time, he is spending the time to care. That's our God. That's why we can be comforted. And that's why we can experience joy. And today we offer the opportunity. He offers the opportunity. And we as his kingdom offer this for those who have never entered into a relationship with him and aren't a part of his family, aren't a part of his kingdom, have never been clothed with Christ in Christian baptism, have never repented of their sin or said, yes, I, I believe, I want to accept this message of, of Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Right here today, you can decide to trust him with your eternal destiny. You can submit, you can surrender your will for his will, become a son of God, put on Jesus Christ by being baptized into him today, and to know that your life will be different. And so, I'm going to ask the, the uh, band, Robert, to come up. And while this song is, is uh, being sung, If God is speaking to you, if you want what he is offering, his initiative to you, and you want to respond and say yes, yes, then please say yes. You are among friends here. Just come, step out. I'll be down front here. Step out and we will take you as you are and guide you for the next step. But don't turn it away. Don't turn it away. Let's stand.